So today I'm going to talk about the importance of environmental education, specifically from a student's perspective. So first of all, just as an introduction of who I am. So I'm a junior at the British School of Chicago, and I'm also the co-founder and co-executive director of EcoCircle International, which is basically a 100% youth-led nonprofit um, that works around the world, uh, focusing on creating grassroots sustainable initiatives led by youth. And we do this through our fellowship, where we educate youth on intersectional environmentalism, give them leadership training, and then use that to generate initiatives, which we all lead through ECI's team. I'm also on the um, core team of Illinois Youth Climate Movement, which basically organizes um, the climate strikes in Illinois. It's the Fridays for Future branch, which is Greta Thunberg's organization. It's their branch in Illinois. So I lead that and that involves planning strikes, raising awareness of the strikes and all sorts of things. I'm also a Wikipedia climate translator, which involves, I've worked with Wikipedia and this came through my work with um, the work with EcoCircle International and Wikipedia and we translate climate information to make the uh, climate movement more internationally accessible. So first of all, we just, I really wanted to focus on the crucial role that teachers play within the environmental movement and especially the influence that they have on youth. You know, I think we all know the impact that a teacher has on each child's life. And I'm sure we can each think of a teacher that has had a significant impact on our lives. So first of all, I just want to talk about how teachers have impacted me and my work as an environmentalist. So at my school, they're always quite open about um, environmentalism and climate change. And it was always caught, taught quite objectively, which I always appreciate, appreciated. You know, from a young age, there wasn't, you know, beating around the bush about what climate change actually was and its causes. I was taught what climate change was, and this is what caused it. They didn't over-politicize the issue. They didn't turn it into a divisive thing like we see on mainstream media today where it's right versus left. It was just, this is anthropogenic climate change. You know, this is the environmental crises, extinction, the importance of biodiversity, and etc. I wouldn't say that certainly wasn't the basis of a lot of curriculums I was taught, but my school was certainly open about it. And that really opened my eyes and acted as a catalyst for me doing further research into environmentalism. And so I always did work within my school in social justice work and environmentalism work. And I would say at first, it was not well accepted. My, my school certainly likes to act like they've always been this very progressive school that has loads of uh, youth activists, but that was not true. Um, it basically started out with my friend and I, Chloe. Uh, we um, started to, well, I was always doing work within my school, but it was often more kind of, I guess, less controversial work, you know, oh, let's do a food drive, you know, things like that. And then I started to talk about um, gun violence prevention, and that was a bit more of a hot topic for people, especially in the US. And this was something my school really pushed back on. Um, you know, we were trying to organize the walkout at my school after the Parkland shooting, and we'd put posters up, and they would all rip them down. And I'd be taken out of class, and I'd be told, you can't, you can't do this, why are you doing this? And I'd go, oh, well, kids, kids are going to walk out. I said, it's a walkout. Um, I said, I would like you to be on board with this. That would be great. I don't want to upset the school, but it will happen whether you like it or not. And I made it clear, you know, we weren't protesting the school. We were protesting, um, you know, the lack of gun control, especially in Illinois and Chicago. So eventually, kind of with the students kept on pushing and pushing and pushing, specifically me, um, eventually it came to fruition and the school kind of accepted it. And not only did they accept it, but they started to become increasingly supportive. And not only were we seeing support from parents and students and teachers, but even the student leadership team um, at my school started to become really supportive and um, now we're invited to speak at conferences with principals around the world to be, you know, the star students that are leading the school to do all these amazing things. But I think the point is a lot of students think that they have to be in a school that's totally supportive of them for them to be able to make change. But if that space is not available for you, you make space. And we've seen this with lots of movements, you know, the women's rights movement, uh, indigenous rights movements, and with um, youth environmentalism. If there's not a space for the table, you pull up a chair, you know, and even in a school setting where it's supposed, supposed to be where students are given these platforms, but a lot of the time it's kind of, especially with, um, if it's a private school, it's kind of working around what's going to give the school profit and lots of different factors involved. But I think really teachers especially 
did influence my role in that. In fact, I have not touched on this yet. Important point. There was a one teacher actually who, after the walkout, she came up to me and my friend and she basically offered us to do a school club at my school. And she was incredibly supportive. And at first, when the, the entire school wasn't supportive, it was just her continually standing by us. And this grew and grew and grew. And she was always supportive and always pushing us to kind of do better and be better and really follow our passions. And now with EcoCircle International, without that teacher, Miss Lyons, I don't think I would ever be where I am today. So you know, not only is it really important for students to be pushing this and to make room, but also it's important for the teachers to support them and be there for them, even if kind of the school system itself isn't necessarily making room for them. Um, so how has this impacted my school community? So I touched on this slightly, but now um, with my school, we are able to create composting systems. We even totally banned plastic water bottles in my school, which did receive uh, backlash, you know, from certain students. You know, I... Um, we had we kept on finding plastic water bottles turn up in my classroom that students would put there to like upset me. Very, very weird and a waste of money for them. But they would like go out. They would go up to me and like in my face, like hand out plastic water bottles, things like that. So even though students are starting to make these changes, there was still a bit of pushback. And this is where teachers did come into play and teachers were being supportive. And, you know, instead of kind of ignoring this, they were just saying, you know, hey, uh, why are you doing this? You know, these students are trying to protect the planet and for absolutely no reason, um, you're kind of raining on their parade, so to speak. But eventually we had more and more traction and it really changed the kind of community's outlook on not only youth activism, where previously it was seen as just an excuse to skip school, but then when they really saw people such as myself leading by example and teachers supporting them, this made it a lot more. And as was spoken about in the last presentation, the fact that it's a movement, not just a moment or one kind of initiative, this consistency within both the teachers and the students really showed other students how important this was. So, you know, just doing clothes swaps and um, composting, as I said, just simple things like that and running workshops and presentations. Now I would say a lot of my school is very much aware of the environmental crises and just day by day, you see them not only getting involved in the youth climate movement, but changing their day-to-day -day lives. So what all schools need to teach? So at first, when I started running workshops and telling people how to be sustainable, you know, there's kind of a list almost that you give out to people, essentially. It's, you know, oh, turn the lights off when you leave the room, uh, reduce your red meat consumption, all these different kinds of things that I used to give presentations and it was almost laughable. You know, I'd have a thing, oh, these are the things you can do to help the planet. And it would be a huge long list of things that, quite frankly, I didn't even remember and no one else did. And this caused me to really reflect on my own life. How was I living sustainably? And, you know, how was I actively practicing this? And I wasn't going into a room and, you know, getting out my checklist of how I can be sustainable. It was just thinking, having this sustainable mindset where you kind of view the world in a circular manner, where you really assess what you are doing and the impact that that is having on, you know, whether it be the production of that or afterwards and how that's being, you know, remove just take a plastic water bottle for example you know without a sustainable mindset you simply see this oh it's something convenient I'm going to drink water from this and then I'm going to throw it away but if you develop this sustainable mindset that needs to be taught in schools just like being kind is taught in schools just like don't bully is taught in schools just like how to you know do your mul multiplications is taught in schools sustainable mindset is just as important if not more important because this is both impacting humans and the planet for generations and generations to come. So that's a huge thing that I would just like to stress for you to kind of take with you is teach a sustainable mindset. And that can be different for everyone and different for every class, but just kind of get children to think about and reflect on the impact that each thing they are doing is having holistically. Okay. And once again, what is school for? What is it truly for? There's, you know, a lot of factors for this. There's only three here, um, but skills for life, employability and finding your purpose and sustainability not only did this for me, but it can do this for everyone. Skills for life, as I was talking about before, having a, a sustainable mindset is a critical skill for life. Not only, you know, having sustainable finance, you know, where you're not purchasing, you know, a 10,000 dollar vehicle when you only have 5,000. It's that same kind of mentality that we apply to environmentalism. If you only have 
this amount of resources, you have to use it sustainably so you can survive off of it and kind of treat it in a circular manner rather than immediately using it up. And now everyone's shocked. Oh, no, we are having an extinction. You know, these are things that to many people and many scientists aren't surprising. But the fact that we lack these skills to act in a sustainable way has, is just directly driving us downward and needs to be taught in schools. Also, employability. So most people think, you know, I tell them I'm an environmentalist. They go, oh, you're going to be so poor. You know, you're going to you're going to live in a, some kind of cheap apartment. You're going to work for a nonprofit. And, you know, absolutely nothing wrong with that. Right. But the key sustainability is a huge growing market and growing sector. And I have a graph here just showing you growth in sustainable investments between 2012 and 2018 alone. And as you can see, it is growing massively. And so if you really want to talk about what's employable here, you know, there are quite a few parents that have pushed back to my school starting to teach more sustainable things saying, oh, I need, I need my kids to be taught something useful. Are you kidding me? Not only is this useful in day to day life and helpful for people, this is going to get your kid a job, you know, and this applies to any kind of um, class, whether it be art or history or languages or science, because as I'm going to talk about later, sustainability is very interdisciplinary and also with finding purpose. So, you know, with people struggling increasingly with mental health issues, the issue that I have seen with a lot of people and mental health is very complicated and it's not just about finding purpose, but by giving youth the op opportunity to make a positive impact, that will get rid of so many of these issues where they feel, you know, depressed or anxious or hopelessness or hopelessness because now they have a purpose. They have something to work for. And before, you know, they may have felt like the school life didn't actually have meaning, but now they're actually able to contextualize it in a real world situation. And it's giving them hope and it's giving them drive to live and go on, which unfortunately a lot of people don't feel. Once again, mental health is, that was a very simple kind of view of mental health, but that certainly does play a role, finding purpose. And just here, sustainability will both be the single biggest challenge and opportunity in 2020. And I touched on this with employment. Not only is it a big issue and it's a crisis, but it also is an amazing chance for opportunity. You know, for example, if we talk about um, reducing our emissions of greenhouse gas. By um, reducing those emissions, we're also going to be reducing air pollution that is causing respiratory illnesses for people in those communities. So that's just one, uh, one example. Anybody else lose sound? Sorry. No. No, we're okay. I think you were... Um, Jude, you can go. Sorry about okay. that. Sorry about that. It's okay. Okay, so... Just one thing, why is teaching about the environmental crises not controversial? You know, if you talk about, oh, I'm going to run a workshop on climate change, it's kind of like, you know, and I'm like, well, do you believe in climate change or not necessarily believe? Do you know that climate change is real? Everyone's going to be like, well, yeah. And I'm like, well, why is it a controversial issue? And they're going to be like, oh, oh, you know, well, well, those people, those people don't want you to talk about it. I'm like, well, let's think about it. You know, if we want to talk about politicians who don't want to talk about climate change, who are they being funded by? You know, who, you know, if we want to talk about these plastic companies, these fashion companies, these fo the fossil fuel industry, they do not want you to be talking about this. They do not want you to be making this change because that is not profitable for them. So essentially, by deeming this issue as controversial, we're following the agenda of these people who are profiting off of it. So as we're feeding into this scheme of, oh, we're not going to talk about air pollution. We're not going to we're not going to, you know, these tree huggers, they don't care about humans. This is about humans. This is crucial. You know, this is the sixth mass, mass extinction, as we were talking about. Eventually, the Earth will recover from climate change and the impact that we have made. This is not necessarily about if the Earth will recover. This is about if humans will be able to kind of continue through this damage that we are making. And I'm not saying that climate change is going to wipe out humanity. That would be a little bit too extreme for my liking. But it's certainly going to be damaging the health of a lot of communities. It's going to be it not only is going to be it is and it's going to be damaging the homes of a lot of communities, especially in um, kind of uh, like coastal communities. So those are just some examples. So certainly not a controversial issue. And I briefly touch on this, but do students care about academics with no real world context? Likely not, you know, although some students may love solving geometric sequences or analyzing poems, you know, nothing wrong with that. But a lot of 
students struggle with the fact that they don't believe that what they are learning in school has any real world applications, which I disagree with. But a lot of people have this mindset because they are not given real world context. But for better or for worse, environmentalism has a lot of real world context and it allows students to see the relevance of what they're learning. It creates passion beyond the classroom. And as I said before, it improves mental health. So by just touching on, for example, say you're talking about the Industrial Revolution, and not only are you talking about how this impacted England and caused, it, caused England's economy to grow, but also talk about how this impacted the environment both within England and internationally, as you think about the regions where these resources were being mined to cause the Industrial Revolution, simple things like that, where you're really connecting the dots to real world context or even in English, if you're learning how to write a speech, why not get them to write a speech to the UN about why climate change is important? It's simple real world things like this that contextualize what they're learning that will both motivate students. And when it comes to the time where they probably are actually applying this to real world case scenarios, they have experience in doing this. And with both EcoCircle International and Illinois Youth Climate Movement, it really has been crucial to see the skills that people have learned in school and they're applying it to real world situations. And I have really been able to contextualize what I've learned in school. And that has really improved both my mental health and my motivation through academics. Because personally, now I find it selfish not to work hard in school because not only am I wasting the teacher's time and my parents' money paying for the school, but also I'm wasting that opportunity that I would have had to help the environment and to help its people. So it really is a huge motivating factor for students. And as I touched on before, the environmental crises is very intersectional and interdisciplinary. So a lot of teachers may think, for example, with art, oh, you know, what does art have to do with the environmental crises? So many things. One, if we just talk about the impact that art has, if we talk, want to talk about the impact of acrylic paint in water systems, simple things like that, very important to reflect on, especially as an artist. But also, if you want to talk about the things that art can do to contribute to environmentalism, if we talk about art activism, you know, when I first started EcoCircle International, I found it really crucial to find artists to do digital art um for you know our instagram and to make our videos things like that because i didn't like the skills but i needed someone who did so then i had to draw from all the different disciplines to kind of create this diverse team to really get done what i needed to get done so that's the end um so just basically saying yeah sustainability benefits both the planet and our students both in and out of the classroom so i hope you guys found that helpful and if you want to check out EcoCircle International on Instagram or Illinois Climate Movement, you can feel free just to follow what we're doing.